Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? In the 1990s, technology advanced quickly. And while upgrading your desktop PC was common, that wasn't the case for laptops. This time, let's check out a replacement CPU module that brought dramatically better performance to one of Apple's workhorse retro notebooks. The PowerBook 1400 was launched in late 1996 as a mainstream laptop and shipped with a PowerPC 603E processor clocked at 117, 133, or 166 megahertz. This offered respectable performance when the machine was new, but the G3 processor brought far better speeds when it debuted in 1998. By 1999, the 1400 had been discontinued for a year and was showing its age. Most owners opted to simply buy new machines, but a few diehard users preferred to keep their laptops and upgrade them. This 1400 has already seen its RAM boosted from the stock 16 megabytes to 64, but the ultimate upgrade was to replace the CPU, which a company called Innerware made possible. This is the Booster 1400 G3, which was sold outside Japan as the Vimage V-Power series. It was offered in two speeds, 233 MHz and a Japan-exclusive 333 MHz model. And both came in rather attention-grabbing packaging. That faster card is the one I opted to install in my 1400, which was the middle spec model with 133 MHz CPU. Included in the box was a driver disk, warranty card, and installation instructions, along with a flyer for Innerware's other products. Tucked underneath was the card itself, along with the only two tools needed, Phillips and 5mm socket drivers. But first, some benchmarks. The MacBench Synthetic CPU and FPU tests place the machine far below the baseline PowerMac G3 system clocked at 300 MHz. This just goes to show how big of a performance improvement the G3 CPU provided beyond just clock speed. A more meaningful test was ripping CD tracks to MP3s, and with SoundJam MP set to produce 256 kilobit per second files, the system was barely able to manage a speed of half real time. We can do better. I started by shutting down the 1400 and disconnecting its power cable. Normally one would need to flip the machine over and remove the battery, but in my case this isn't really necessary. In an effort to keep the battery from leaking, I've taped over its contacts so it can't be charged. Then the speaker grill across the top of the keyboard simply needed to be pushed to the left a bit and lifted away. After that, the keyboard could flip onto the palm rest. There's no need to disconnect it. The machine's heatsink is held in place with six screws. Then I took it out to reveal what makes this CPU upgrade possible. A modular processor card. This was done to reduce manufacturing costs on Apple's part, but opened the door for third parties like Innerware to engineer new cards that could drop right in. My 1400 has the optional video output board, which is a bit more involved to remove, but there's an easy workaround. I could lift it out of its connector just enough to slip the CPU card from underneath, then slide the new G3 card in its place. And that's really all there was to this upgrade. Innerware and its Vimage subsidiary fully supported end users doing this upgrade themselves, which I'd estimate as taking maybe five minutes at most. Once the machine was put back together, it booted without a problem to macOS 8.6. And at some point, I'll replace the original 1GB IDE drive with a solid-state replacement, but we'll save that for another time. There was something curious in System Profiler, though. It recognized the new CPU as a G3, but only running at 83 MHz. 
And that's because the system also needed drivers in order to fully utilize the upgrade, which I had previously downloaded and copied over. Installing them was quick, after which I was prompted to reboot. But there was a problem. During startup, the extension showed as being disabled, and launching the info application revealed the machine was still running at 83 megahertz. It didn't take long to figure out what was wrong. I had downloaded the latest drivers for vPower cards, which were identical to the ones from Innerware since they were the same company. But vPower never sold the 333 MHz version of this card, so the drivers didn't recognize it. The disc included in the box showed a newer revision, and thankfully was still readable. So I installed it and rebooted as instructed. This time the extension actually loaded, and System Profiler finally showed the correct speed. The only other piece of software included on the disc was a control strip module that let you toggle the backside cache. So what about the performance? Macbench shows drastically different numbers this time. 8 percentage points faster than the 300 MHz baseline machine for CPU tests, and 10 points faster on floating point operations. This is pretty impressive given that the bus speed on the PowerBook is half that of the G3 desktop. MP3 encoding likewise shows major improvement. The same track using the same settings now converted at twice that of real time. This was a big deal at the time, and the booster's packaging even made note of this, as ripping CDs in the late 90s was often the most computationally intensive thing the average computer would do. And if you're curious, changing the encoding settings didn't really affect performance. Switching to 128 kilobit per second files yielded similar results. Of course, this kind of upgrade didn't come cheap. The 233 MHz version was launched in early 1999, and at $500 US, it was actually aggressively priced. A slightly faster 250 MHz card from competitor Newer Technology sold for $800. Innerware and its Vimage subsidiary made CPU cards for a number of other Mac models as well, and in some cases, they were the first or only ones to offer upgrades for some machines, like the Performa 6400. They quickly gained a reputation for producing solid upgrades that offered good value. This business model wasn't sustainable, unfortunately. The duo faced competition from several other vendors, and since all of them had to source the most expensive component, the G3 CPU, from IBM, it meant that competing on price came down to accepting lower margins. There simply was minimal opportunity to cut costs. And the Mac CPU upgrade market just wasn't that large to begin with, either. In many cases, it would have cost half as much as a new machine just to boost an older one to the same performance, increase the RAM, and swap out the hard drive. By the end of the millennium, the combination of technologies like USB and Firewire, plus the striking designs of new Macs, backed the upgrade makers into a corner. And questions about whether Apple would support upgraded computers with its OS X operating system gave potential customers cold feet. They didn't want to drop that kind of money on an old computer that would still leave them stuck in the past. In late 1999, Vimage simply couldn't keep going. A press release said that the company would transition to only producing OEM cards for other companies to resell, but it ultimately shut down. Parent company Innerware continued on, releasing the 333 MHz upgrade card we saw, and began to branch out with multimedia accessories like webcams and video capture cards. But its financial troubles continued, and in late 2000, it filed for bankruptcy in Japan and closed for good. Innerware certainly wasn't the only upgrade maker to struggle. Newer technology had filed for bankruptcy twice, first in 1996 and again in January 2001, which put it out of business until being acquired by Otherworld Computing in the middle of 2002. 
XLR8's parent company Interax filed for Chapter 11 in January 2000, and the assets of PowerLogix were also acquired by Otherworld Computing in 2005. Of all the Mac CPU upgrade makers, only Sonnet Technology escaped unscathed. And it did so by also having a robust Mac accessory catalog, which it continues today. Since they weren't exactly commonplace even when new, it's always fascinating to me when I run across one of these upgrades. They're like little time capsules, harking back to a very different era. The computers they went in weren't always meant to be upgraded, but the manufacturers managed to find a way. And their owners ended up with machines that performed far beyond what anyone would have expected. I owe a big thank you to a viewer who goes by Hrushka for sending me these upgrades to check out. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.